Hi, and welcome to the National Oceanography Center's Into the Blue podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Alejandra Sanchez Franks, and today I'm joined by Dr. Claire Evans to learn all about the powerhouse of coastal seas, seagrass. Um, so thank you so much for joining us, Claire. Why don't we kick off by you telling us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Thanks for having me. So, yeah, I've had a rather circuitous career path. So I started out studying biomedicine and microbiology. However, I decided I didn't want a career where I was just smearing bodily fluids and analyzing <laughs> them. So then I did a master's in applied marine science. And as part of which I got to go to Norway, which for, for me at the time was a really big adventure and do some field work there where I was looking at how viruses uh, kill phytoplankton in the sea. And so I absolutely fell in love with um, doing field work and decided that that was the career for me. And since then, I did a PhD looking at how viruses cycle sulfur through the Earth system. And then more recently, my career has been looking at all the different ways that the ocean impacts the carbon cycle. And particularly at the moment, I'm working a lot on the blue carbon habitat seagrass. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about what seagrass is and why it's important? Sure. So it, seagrass is a plant, just like um, the sort of grass that you would have on land, except, of course, it lives in the salty environment of the, the marine system. Um, so like a grass on land, it has long sort of frond-like leaves and a root system that it needs to uh, bury down into the soil or sediments, as we call it, and um, grow on the base of the seabed. So it's, it's important to really stems from the fact that it's a vital part of coastal ecosystems and it provides us with what we term ecosystem services. So these are sort of goods or services, if you like. Um, so this might be supporting fish stocks or uh, helping to purify our coastal waters. So you mentioned coast and seagrass. Is that the predominant location for seagrass? Is it a global, is it in a global environment? Are there any hotspots? Could you tell us a little bit more about where you would typically find seagrass? Absolutely. So um, seagrass is pretty much global in distribution. So you find it everywhere except for the poles. Um, now, of course, uh, like a land plant, it needs light to grow. So it typically occurs in the shallow ocean where the light can penetrate to the, the seabed and typically in areas where there's um, quite nice water quality and so there's not too much murkiness in the seawater. So could you tell us a bit more about how seagrass might be a vital part of the ecosystem? What does it do? So seagrass is an incredibly valuable marine habitat because it just does a plethora of really, really useful things. So I'll just try and tell you about some of them now. The list is pretty endless. Um, but because of its shape, you know, so having these uh, long leaves and its roots or rhizomes, as we call them, down in the sediments, it really does a great job at sort of stabilizing um, the seabed and, and the coastal system. So, so in terms of physically stabilizing that system. And also when you imagine there's waves or there's current passing over those long frond like leaves, this actually decreases the energy, so it sort of slows those waves and currents down. So, so all in all, it's really good for coastal protection. And also, it's an absolute haven for marine life. So it provides shelter and it provides food. And there are lots of species that actually um, use the, the seagrass as a habitat in which to reproduce, so part of their life cycle. So it's really important in supporting biodiversity and in supporting things like commercial fisheries as well. And yeah, as I mentioned, it helps to improve water quality by soaking up excess nutrients that come off the land. And um, again, because those leaves are reducing the flow of uh, water above, what tends to happen is if there's any particles in that seawater, they tend to sort of sink out and become incorporated into the, the sediments or the soil below the seagrass themselves. So this is really good as it improves our water quality or, or clarity, if you like, but it also helps to trap organic matter, which is really important as this is rich in carbon. So this carbon then be stored there and this is important because it keeps it out of the atmosphere. So we tend to call this blue carbon. So blue carbon is a term we're hearing a lot. I just wondered if you could clarify what is meant by blue carbon? Sure. So, so actually it's interesting because there are uh, blue carbon means different things to different people. So some people might think of blue carbon as 
all the carbon in the marine environment. So, you know, whatever form that might be in organisms dissolved in the seawater in the seabed. Um, whereas other people regard it more um, as the coastal vegetated habitats. So when I'm thinking about those, this is seagrass, but also it's things like salt marshes, it's mangroves, it's, it's anything that's rooted and growing uh, in our coastal oceans typically. But the way we think of it at NOC and the way I think of it personally as well is that it's any carbon in the ocean that we can manage and typically associated with sort of the natural system. So by management, I'm thinking of things like potentially we could manage a fishery to increase the amount of stock in that fishery because the organisms themselves contain carbon. Or it could be what we do on the seabed. You know, do we do we stop trawling, for example, if that's releasing carbon out of the seabed? Or it could be, of course, protecting our our coastal vegetated habitats, so seagrass, mangrove um, and salt marshes, or restoring them even. And, and so that's something we're particularly interested in. It's really interesting to hear how what a big role seagrass has with carbon. Could you say a little bit about the mechanics of how seagrass captures and stores blue carbon? Absolutely. So it all comes down again to this kind of shape of the, the plant and how it interacts with the environment. Um, so the, the, the actual plant itself, of course, fixes carbon by the process of photosynthesis, photosynthesis, put my teeth in. <laughs> um, so this is just the same as, like I said, a land plant where they're fixing carbon dioxide into their biomass and then pieces of that plant may break off. And so the leaves itself may get incorporated into the sediments. But also it's um, carbon that's coming from anywhere. So any kinds of organic matter that that get trapped. And then what the seagrass are really good at is making a kind of cap or cover over that carbon store and building it up as it goes. So that carbon essentially becomes locked away underneath the, the seagrass bed itself. So you imagine if you lost that that seagrass bed, you might you might lose that carbon as well. So so that's generally how we think of it working. That is incredible. So does this mean that in some ways seagrass is particularly good at storing carbon? How does it compare um, with with other environments or or even uh, terrestrial? Yeah. So um, well, seagrass is is really good at storing carbon in the sense that we know that the carbon in seagrass beds might be millennia old. So it's been there for such a long time. And, and actually what's really cool about seagrass and, and why I think it's, it's a good uh, solution for us to start looking at is that it's quite quick at sequestering carbon, so capturing carbon. So even though a forest in the long run might have more carbon in it, if you restore a forest and a seagrass bed at the same time, you're going to get a lot more carbon sequestered in a shorter oh, wow. time span with the seagrass. So it's really, really important with that regard, you know. That's incredible. Um, so I wanted to ask you something a little bit left field. <laughs> you said at the beginning how field work was a really important part of why you went into this field and this career path. And with everything that you're, you're talking now about seagrass, which is just incredibly interesting. Um, I was just wondering, uh, at, at some point did they intersect? Are you currently doing field work, uh, you know, looking at seagrass? What is, what is the hot thing to do right now in terms of field work and seagrass? So that's an interesting question because um, whilst at the, the beginning of our chat today, I was telling you about how much I love field work. I think <laughs> <laughs> I'm rather older than I was when I did my master's project. And so um, these days I have to say that I'm not as keen on doing field work, particularly because I've got two fairly young children. Um, but what are the hot things to do? Well, I have. I've been very lucky um, to do some fabulous field work on seagrass. And, and in <laughs> fact, the last big trip I did, well, the last trip I did was to the Isle of Man. But prior to that, it was Antigua in the Caribbean. Wow. So, so you know, that that's absolutely fantastic. And what will we be doing generally is actually um, taking sediment cores from seagrass beds. So if you imagine that a lot of the time they're submerged habitats, so they're covered in seawater, so that would involve us taking a boat and essentially what's like a drain drain pipe, if you like. So just a, a long tube and you push it into the sediments and collect that out, which is um, even for me, that's still good fun, actually, <laughs> you know, when you're doing that in the Caribbean. But as I say, we also, you know, we work around um, the coast in the UK and, and the Isle of Man at the moment as well. So 
um, you know, that that was the last campaign I did. So, um, yeah, similar approach. And so what is what is hot in seagrass right now? Well, there's lots of questions. We still don't really understand the fundamentals, like how much carbon they sequester. Where does that carbon come from? Uh, you know, exactly how quickly they do it and how can we maximize those factors, you know, to, to improve its uh, sequestration. And then just a host of other questions as well around how it links into carbon cycling. So we think they might be producing greenhouse gases under some conditions. And so we really need to know what those are to inform management strategies into the future. So that's um, just a flavor. Of that's incredible. <laughs> it sounds like a good time to get into seagrass. Lots of great questions to answer. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so and going back a little bit to uh, to what we were talking about before, which was blue carbon. Uh, could you maybe say a bit more about why it's so important? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm a biogeochemist, which means I study all the pathways that influence the flow of elements through the Earth system. So what I'm really interested in is carbon biogeochemistry. So that is where that carbon is. Is it in the atmosphere? Is it on the land? Is it in the sea? And when it's in the sea, it can be in various places. And um, the thing about the, the blue carbon is, so this carbon that we want to manage and um, the, the idea is that actually we could do something to enhance that carbon. You know, we could change the way um, we use our marine habitats to actually increase that carbon. And of course, if that carbon is there, and particularly if it remains there for a long time, this stops it potentially ending up in the atmosphere. And that, of course, is so, so important in terms of um, mitigating the um, climate change that we're seeing at the moment. So, yeah, yeah that really highlights the role that seagrass plays in in climate change so in a way this means that does that sorry not to put words in your mouth but does that mean that uh, in a way we could maybe manipulate seagrass to uptake more carbon from the so, atmosphere yeah that's an interesting question i don't think it's about manipulating the seagrass per se what i think it's about is um firstly protecting the seagrass we have so we, it's a very threatened habitat and we're losing seagrass and other blue carbon habitats as well all the time, particularly these coastal vegetated habitats. So the first thing would be just protecting what we have. And of course, the only way you can get them protected is to provide the evidence to those people who manage the coast to show them why they need to protect it. So that's kind of the first thing. And then the second thing, of course, is we could restore it from areas where it has been lost. Um, however, I don't think it's a case of manipulating it. But one of the, the things that my work is um, focused on is actually looking at, well, where best should we restore it? You know, so if we understand all these factors that control how it sequesters carbon, then, you know, for example, if we know, oh, they're really good at capturing uh, organic material coming off the land. Um, via rivers or something, then you might want to cite your seagrass restoration efforts in an estuary. Or if we know that the energy of the system, if it's too, too high, that's not going to be very good either. So then we might want to consider putting the seagrass in a lagoon environment as opposed to a, uh, a quite an exposed coastal environment. So it's, it's sort of more factors like that. It's not about changing the seagrass itself. It's about how best to work within its natural capabilities. Strategic restoration, maybe. Absolutely. I like that. <laughs> I'll use that. <laughs> um, so that's a really in interesting point about uh, preserving and the strategy in, in restoring that. Uh, do you have a sense of how much we've lost of seagrass? Absolutely. Well, um, we have quite some detailed studies for the UK. Um, and the estimates range from about half of our seagrass to more oh like 90% of our seagrass. And um, so that that is the case. You know, we really um, we know that the seagrass over the last hundred years around temperate waters was absolutely decimated. So this is primarily as a result of poor water quality. So with the increase in water quality that we've seen with the water quality framework directive, so appropriate legislation, um, we're seeing that now uh, lots of uh, parts of the coast are able to to host seagrass again. But it's, if you've wiped it down to such a low level, it's hard for it to bounce back again without some help. So we know that we're going to have to intervene. So that's, you know, that, that's kind of a, a critical part of the, the work that we're doing now. And more broadly, as I said, um, there's some scary figures about, you know, around the world 
we're, we're sort of decimating like so many football pitches worth of seagrass and, and mangrove and salt marsh every day. That's so, terrifying. Yeah. So what, what projects at the NOC are, are you currently involved in or that exist here that are sort of going towards this uh, an effort to protect seagrass? Um, so we're actually doing um, research all around um, the world at the moment, um, looking at seagrass and, and other blue carbon habitats as well. Um, so as I said, it's, it's about these fundamental questions of trying to understand how much carbon they're actually capturing and, you know, where that might come from. So basically we work together with um, various governmental stakeholders and managers of the coastal zone um, to try and... Uh, give them this evidence and give them recommendations of how they can uh, manage this uh, manage this resource. So, for example, one of the projects we're doing in the UK, um, we're um, looking at where the seagrass is, um, looking at where it could be, trying to identify if we put it here, what would be the ecosystem service gain? And also more than that, looking at factors such as social acceptance. So it's quite interesting when you get into more the, the, the social cultural dynamic of these ecosystems. Because there's a lot of potential conflicts sometimes in use of the coast. So um, sorry, can I just interject? When sure. you say social acceptance, you mean us as a society? Um, yeah, so, so one of the important questions in our research is actually looking at why in some areas of the UK... Um, seagrass restoration is uh, very gladly received. You know, it's it's actually being driven from a grassroots level, pardon the pun. And, <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know, it's local communities that are actually reseeding their own seagrass. And then there are other environments um, where, you know, e efforts to actually preserve the seagrass that they have. So, for example, no mooring zones in some parts of the UK have met with quite strong resistance. Wow. And one of the interesting um, things that occurred recently is um, one of the study sites that we actually look at is a seagrass bed that was restored um, off the south coast of Wales not so long ago. And actually very recently since that particular project's inception, um, a trawler as a protest trawled right through that restored seagrass bed. Oh. So it's about, so, so of course, what's un important is understanding why in some places people are resistant to these kind of efforts and why in other places it's so, so successful, you know, and because if we have that knowledge, it means we can focus our efforts on those environments where it's really going to be welcomed and, you know, it, it actually pays back socioeconomically um, to the communities that are um, close to those restoration efforts. So have you found, uh, I find that really interesting. I, I had no idea. Um, is there some component of the difference in, you know, how the public is educated about ocean science and the sea and seagrass? So ocean literacy, um, as you rightly state, so, you know, how people understand about the, the marine system, how much they understand, like, um, you know, ha what, what seagrass actually does, you know. Um, so that is we think is an important factor. And so it's one of the things we're also looking into is, you know, obviously someone in the middle of Birmingham or something probably doesn't have much, um, you know, contact with seagrass, but then a fishing community or so they might do. So we're surveying all these different um, communities and asking them their thoughts about it, their knowledge about it. How do they value these things? But also um, seeing if we give them that level of education whereby they might be able to make more of an informed choice, does that change their value of this habitat? Would they then get behind a restoration effort, which they might not have before? So I think you're right. Ocean literacy is just so, so critical, you know. That's incredible. That's some really great insight into the UK. I wonder if you had any perspective on the sort of global community in terms of aiding efforts for seagrass? Absolutely. So, um I mean, as I mentioned, we're very fortunate to be working at various sites throughout the world. So we have a big, big network in Southeast Asia. I've mentioned, you know, some of our work in the Caribbean and we're working in the Middle East as well. Um, and so what we're seeing globally really is uh, the tide is starting to change. Sorry, I can't help marine puns. <laughs> um, and, you know, we're really starting to realize that the, the first step in combating um, the climate and the biodiversity crisis we're facing is actually to protect and restore these habitats. So I think that idea is gaining traction around the world. And certainly, for example, the, the, the network that um, we have in Southeast Asia at the moment is trying to figure out 
um, what, how the, the, uh, the activities we conduct on the land, how that actually impacts our blue carbon habitats and their sort of near shore. So, so you know, these, all of these questions are now coming to the, the fore. And actually, I've worked a lot um, in collaboration with the Belizean government to try and figure out how best to manage their resources in terms of um, blue carbon as well. So, you know, we see this it, it, generally this initiative is really taking off right around the globe. Wow, that's incredible. So in terms of the NOC, what's what's next in terms of seagrass conservation? Um, so, yeah, as I say, um, we're kicking off new projects all the time and we've just got a big one um, that is kicking off, which will be focused on Malaysia. And here again, it's dealing with this question of looking at, you know, what goes on in the land and how that affects our blue carbon. Um, so we're also really focused on how do we value the ecosystem services that um, seagrass and other marine habitats provide. And this is really important because it's not just about carbon, it's about fishery support, it's about, you know, protection of the coast. So we have a number of um, projects uh, around the world, actually, that were looking at these various different factors and attempting to put a number on that. And whilst in some ways it is a bit distasteful to try and put a number on these services, you know, we should just intrinsically value them, of course. But if you are a manager, you can't argue with cold hard facts. So this is the best arsenal in our, or, or weapon in our arsenal, if you like, in terms of getting seagrass on the table and getting it protected is to, um, you know, generate these numbers. So we're working on that. And yes, also look at trying to, to answer this question of are they actually sources of greenhouse gas themselves? You know, is that due to some kind of um, uh, pollution forcing or, you know, some kind of uh, activity that we could potentially manage or change? So, so a whole <laughs> range of projects on the go right now. That sounds incredible. And I totally get the point that you you're making about monetizing it. You know, it, it feels yeah. a bit alien to what we do. But, mm. it, you know, if this is if this is how we need to get the point across, then then I think that that's great. That's the way forward. So I just wanted to close by asking. Um, so if anyone wanted to learn more about uh, seagrass, uh, did, did you have any recommendations for links or resources? Absolutely. So, um, well, I want to give a bit, big shout out to uh, my project partners, Project Seagrass, who have an absolutely fantastic website, which they, you can go and take a look at. So it's really easy to find online. But specifically for what the NOC's up to, if you have a look at the NOC pages, there's one of our big projects, which is called uh, RESO. Um, so if you just type that in and look for the NOC, you can see specifically what we're up to. And that project is live now. So um, it'll be nice to see how that develops. That's great. Thank you so much for joining us on the podcast, Claire. So uh, as Claire just told us, if you want to learn more about the role of seagrass, please head over to the website, noc.ac.uk, and visit our Under the Surface pages. And to listen to the previous episodes, search NOC Into the Blue. So thank you so much and see you in the next podcast. Thank you.